let me just quickly introduce uh, this panel, the, the reason, and I want to thank Aphrodite to, for having set up the, 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 the panel so quickly with Fabio and with the speakers. Um, the reason why we're organizing this panel is that we have a partnership with the Swiss Confederation on uh, organizing hackathons for uh, aging and disabilities in relation with the big challenges in Asia Pacific. That's why we have, organ uh, we have invited uh, 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 four speakers uh, that I'm going to quickly introduce. First, we're going to have uh, Marta Perez Cuso, who is the uh, Economic Affair, um, Affairs Officer at UNSCAP, which is the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific uh, for the United Nations, um, who is going to tell us more about inclusive innovation for disabilities. Then we will have uh, really the chance to have um, Maggie uh, Goody, uh, who is the president of Andy Capable, but most importantly, she's the mother of uh, Emma that you see in the picture. Emma has participated twice to the Hackathon Hacker Health, which is one very nice hackathon that is occurring in, in Geneva. She will tell, me, tell us a bit more about it and what is the experience from a, from a, um, a, a parent of a disabled person a perspective. And uh, we also very honored to have uh, uh, Najme Khalili Mahan from uh, Concordia University. Uh, um, uh, we don't know each other, Najme, but I'm very, very much looking for what, uh, what you're going to tell us about media and technology for resilience and aging, in aging. And, uh, and last but most, not least, Bettina Ferdman, who is the head of development and innovation at Fondation Fides, which is a, a newborn foundation in Geneva, uh, which goal is to foster innovation for social, for social enterprises. So, so when I moved to, to Bangkok, I wanted to explore how uh, we could promote science, technology, and innovation policies that will bring more inclusive outcomes and really support this transformative agenda of the UN of leaving no one behind. And so that was the, the question, why are we innovating? Um, we started exploring what were some of the experiences in, in Asia and what could be different means and mechanisms to promote um, innovation that will have more inclusive outcomes. And one of the first messages is we have to see from when we promote um, innovations for the poor versus when we promote innovations by the poor. The, the, those are two very um, different and complementary approaches on how one may want to think about um, developing innovations for different uh, marginalized uh, groups. And um, I, um, we don't have particular experience on the area of disability. Um, it's an area uh, we've explored in one uh, workshop and we've had a couple of opportunities to interact. And I will just want to uh, share with you um, some of those thoughts that we had um, in, um, behind uh, what it means to promote innovations for persons with disability. And, and here it's first, what. Um, how do we define disability? Um, what we, when we talk about disabilities, and we had the pleasure to have a very good uh, training, internal training for UN uh, staff at ESCAP on disabilities, because at the global UN level, this and the Secretary General is promoting a strategy, supporting a strategy for inclusion of persons with disability within um, the UN. And in this training um, that was provided by Peter Tan, um, he, he made a very good um, explanation of what's a person with disability. And it's not simply a person that has some um, physical or, or, or mental impairment. It's, we, we talk of disability when there's the attitudinal and environmental barriers that prevent that person from leading a, a, a a full life and to have agency. So it's, it's not because a person is in a um, wheelchair that cannot fully um, lead its life. It's because also the environmental context that we face and also um, stigma and other attitudinal barriers that persons with disability face. And this came up very clearly from our workshop that we had um, on technology and innovation for persons with disability. In Asia, 
um, there is a very strong stigma um, for persons with disability. That's the message that, that I, I could hear very loud and clear. Um, so if you want to innovate, if you want to develop, uh, to, to innovate uh, for persons uh, with disability, it's not just about the technological solution, but it's also about addressing those um, environmental um, uh, barriers and attitudinal um, barriers. Now, on the other dimension, uh, what I meant, uh, what, I would like to reinforce the, um, the point that I made about two approaches for how we innovate for marginalized groups. And one way is to bring solutions to those um, uh, marginalized groups. And uh, one could be uh, persons with disability. And the other way of thinking about that is also about involving persons with disability in, um, in, in having an agency to develop also uh, solutions. Um, we've, we, we've, we are talking here a lot about the context of hackathons and makerspace and, and firms. And I would just want to drop that question of who is able to participate on those hackathons and the importance of persons with disability to come up with, with solutions. And I want to share this image. And this is an innovation from India, and it's a walker for stairs. And uh, the walkers is a, tec a technical solution for persons that have problems to, to, to walk, uh, um, but they often uh, cannot um, walk upstairs or downstairs. Um, would you know who developed this solution? The idea came from a girl at um, in uh, year eight. She saw her uh, grandfather uh, or grandmother um, that had couldn't go upstairs and downstairs, and she came up with her own design of how it could uh, work. Um, she had designed something that had. Uh, that you can extend the leg in, in the front or the, uh, at the back, depending if you were going upstairs or downstairs. Of course, what she designed didn't look like this. Um, this final design came through the support of innovation organization, the um, um, uh, national, uh, Indian National Foundation, which uh, tries to support grassroots innovations. Um, and this, um, so I wanted to, to highlight here the importance of also who participates in the design of those uh, technological um, solutions. And I, I will just stop there. Those are my, my, my two thoughts for, for today, um, put for thought. And if you want to follow up more on the work that we do on promoting inclusive technology and innovation policies, um, there is a, a web thing there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mara. The second person I want to invite uh, to, to talk is Maggie Goody. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thomas has asked me to speak to you specifically about the hackathon, the hack of health is what they call it. So I'll, because obviously I, I, I have a lot of experience with disabilities having, having Emma. We actually were involved two years in a row. Um, the first year specifically we had asked the team to develop uh, an arm that um, Emma was going to be able to draw independently. So Emma, just so you, th those of you obviously who don't know her, she um, was born in 2009 with cerebral palsy and she actually has li very limited mobility. Um, um, she's in a wheelchair and she has very little fine motor skills, um, but she's extremely intelligent. And so she absolutely wanted to be able to, to be able to do her own, I would say, kids things and and do some drawing by herself so that was the project for 2019 was that the team was going to be building her a an arm literally that we connected to her desk in her room um, that was able to give her the freedom of mobility to be able to to draw by herself um, so um, that was the first year. And then the second year, um, this year, which was a little bit tiny, but more complicated just because of the COVID reasons, but um, um, she herself asked to modify this same arm 
so that um, I guess she might have been kind of bored with the drawing thing. I don't know, but she wanted to actually do something um, very much independent, which was to feed herself. So Emma has is not able to feed herself. And it's true that it's I think it's something that is close to her heart to be able to give herself her own you know, her own nutrition. So, so that was her decision this year was to, to change this, the same arm and modify it to be able to feed her. So um, I think from our experience, the two years really, if I may say so from our point of view and kind of mark to what you were saying earlier as well, for us as parents, and I'm sure Emma as well, but for us, what we really feel is that this is an, an amazing initiative just because like you said with the barriers, Marta, I think as living with a, a person with a disability like Emma, we're always confronted with these barriers constantly, whether it be infrastructurally or just literally with the handicap itself or the disability itself, but or you know the mentality of people or the culture or et cetera. We're constantly fighting these barriers. And I think the Hack of Health um, literally was without barriers. It was really, you know, limitless. We, Emma could have, or we could have decided anything we wanted to, to develop to help her. Um, so that was really, I would say, something that, you know, is very rare for us to feel is this, is this sort of openness to, to say, okay, let's do something crazy, you know? Um, so that from our point of view was really uh, touching, if I can say. Um, then from Emma's point of view, I think what was really important for her is actually to be able to be heard. I think that especially a person with disabilities, and Martha, this may go with a little bit with what you said as well, is about including people with disabilities in your innovation projects is, you know, a lot of these people, they live with their disabilities. They know what it is like. We don't know what it's like, although we can imagine, and obviously I live with her, but we don't know what it's like. So for her, the Hack of Health, health, health um, Initiative was really uh, an opportunity for her to say, no, this is what I want. This is what I need. And what I really want to maybe work on to increase my independence in the future. Um, so giving her obviously her own empowerment over her own disability, which is huge. Um, and, you know, I think on a daily basis, we're always saying, okay, you know, the the orthopedists and the occupational health and parents and everybody were saying, okay, this is good for you. This is good for you. Okay. This is not good for you. Okay. This, and we're sort of managing her own disability, which this project was really able to let her speak basically. So um, I think the, the positive things to take out of this project were um, specifically the, the sp spirit of the people. I think that um, it certainly stems from the organizers themselves and the energy that they have to do something for the wider good. Um, so as kind of what I said earlier, you really feel like there's no, there's absolutely no prejudices. There's no preconceptions. There's really just everybody. And it, and it creates this energy and this spirit that yeah, that's, it's not often that we feel such an openness. Um, so, and then the also another positive thing is with the organizers, obviously with their energy and their, and the desire to do so, the organization is huge. I mean, they have done a fantastic job. And I think if people were to um, take this idea internationally, it's something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. The organization with the access, with the, you know, it's over 48 hours, so you have to organize the the food, the, uh, you know, the, the, the fun side. So they were actually organizing, they had a huge table of just games for the kids to play during the 48 hours. They organized snacks, they organized a television to watch cartoons, they organized everything um, and also uh, the communication around that as well. It's, it's a huge, I'm sure all of you know, dealing with communication, it's huge to be able to, uh, yeah, communicate to the wider audience, not only the participants, but also uh, the, the people with the disabilities who have their projects going. So, um, and as you mentioned as well, 
um, the organization around this sharing of the information and, and putting this online so that other people elsewhere can use these beginnings of these projects to continue on. So it's a huge organization. I think the, the group did an absolutely wonderful job. Um, also, I think for us as parent, well, as, as Emma as well, I think what really stands out for the Hack of Health is the connections that we made, the personal connections. I think that the, the, the spirit of the, of the event brings in a certain personality of people who really want to do something for the greater good for you know people with disabilities, but not only. And I think it doesn't really matter about the skills that they bring because there's a huge you know, um, um, diversity of people, um, not only culturally, but, you know, you know, you know, uh, um, just in skills, like we had some robotics PhDs to a journalist to, you know, just anybody. So I thought it was important to bring out the, the diversity of the people here because um, it's really people that stick, stick in my mind and made it such a fantastic event. Um, so um, there was one, person called PK, who, who's actually a data scientist. This was last year. Um, he really had no like skills, I would say, in robotics or anything, but he actually was able to make Emma a joystick in 45 minutes. I mean, in, in, the, in the 48 hours, excuse me, in the 48 hours. He actually made her a joystick because he wanted her to be able to not only draw, physically draw on a paper, but also physically draw on a computer. I guess as a computer buff, he knew the importance of wanting to probably draw on, a, on technology. And so he actually developed, not that we didn't even ask him, and he came up with this joystick to have her draw on the computer in 48 hours. And in fact, he was so engaged that he came over months after and actually made her a Wii command. You know, he actually built a Wii command so that she could do like this and actually draw on her computer. Um, also, we had uh, this year, we had a young guy from Nigeria who actually works for the UN and he didn't really have any, he doesn't have any skills in, 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 in robotics or, or, you know, mechanical, anything. And he, but he did have um, the, in, the interest to be there and he actually sewed the entire, it was like a, this, it's an arm where there's a fabric over her arm and he actually sewed the entire thing and he just learned that from his mom in Nigeria. Um, so things like that are extremely important. And then there was another another man this year called Ahmed, who was actually at IT, living in Lyon, so two hours away from here. And he he came back and forth to be able to be involved. And actually, he's coming over still now. What is it? A month and a half afterwards to be able to complete the project. So, just to give you an idea of the the engagement that people have with this project, and I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, and in fact. Um, they were so engaged last year that uh, the association that I'm president for, which is called Handy Capable, we actually encourage, um, um, uh, what do I want to say, inclusion through sports. And we actually organize a, an event called the Handy Challenge every year. Well, unfortunately, not this year because of the COVID, but, um, and the actual, the team, several of the teams that were involved in the hackathon actually um, came back for the Handy Challenge. So just to give you a sense of the personality and the, and the engagement from the people. Um, I think some of the things, if you guys were to, and then I'll, and then I'll stop because I'm talking a lot. Um, I think a few of the things that are something to be aware of is, is, is the preparation for these types of hackathon events. I think what was differed from 2019 and 2020 is that obviously because of COVID reasons, nothing to do with the organization is that in 2019, we were really able to prepare the project, Emma's project beforehand, um, really having even, you know, before now where we weren't so used to having these online video conferences, we actually had online video conferences at the beginning of last year to be able to prepare for the project. So that was really key, I think, in actually being able to hit the you know ground running uh, when we actually, the actual hackathon uh, started. Um, then also, um, also, I think another key point is to actually get the professionals involved. 
a lot of the people that come to this event are younger, maybe students or, or, or learning, you know, a certain discipline. I think what we have learned is that it's really important to get the professionals involved and even, even beforehand to start to like, maybe even, uh, I would say, let them, let the participants know what actually exists in the market already or doesn't for their certain project. You know, if there was already a, an arm in the market that existed, how could they take that already existing arm and modify it to the, the actual project itself? Um, and then why not have them actually there at the hackathon itself, not to, not to do the projects, but actually just to increase the learning and the innovation and the knowledge transfer. Um, also, I think what is key is that we really need to get the haute école, like the, the professional schools involved in this projects. I think there's obviously a desire to, but you know, you know, I don't know where, but I think that there needs to be more communication with the OTCOL, trying to get some of these maybe OT specialists, the robotics specialists, the anybody involved. And um, like I'm involved in, um, in another association where we uh, actually have um, encouraged the, 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 the OT students to get involved in the houses of people with disabilities. So actually they're getting credit. They get actually for 40 hours of time that they spend in the houses, in the in caring for these people with disabilities, they actually are going back and getting credit in their school class hours. So maybe something to think about that. I don't know if there's a challenge to get people involved, or maybe just an idea. And then another last thing, and then I'll I'll, let, I'll pass the, the the microphone over to someone else. Is another thing is how to follow up. Obviously, forty eight hours is not a lot of time to be able to to complete such huge, important projects. So, really, you know how to how to really formalize. I would want to say how to formalize the follow up is really important, and I think something that deserves further discussion. Great, Maggie, thank you very much. And Najem, is your, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that we have been doing in the Media Health Lab and in general, the methodological um, sort of framework that is uh, driving the work that we are doing. Um, to start, uh, this is the problem that we are trying to address. Um, as researchers and as caregivers, uh, uh, we need to come up with technologies that are going to address the question of aging. Um, currently, we are in, um, the, the, this, this is our time, 2020, and there is as many 35-year-old um, uh, uh, individuals in the world as there are adults older than um, 65. But by the time that um, we, who are now on this panel, are reaching our um, senior years, there's going to be many less um, younger individuals to take care of us um, physically, emotionally, and, uh, and economically. And so this is uh, the problem that is motivating and actually pushing for um, a trend about the future of care. And uh, a lot of us, especially those of us who are um, engineers and technology makers um, are claiming that the future of care is going to be digital. And the question that we ask is, should that be so? And this, this pandemic, in fact, has been um, a very good, good is not the right word, but it has been an occasion for us to, to question some of these assumptions that we've had about the role of technology in providing care for older adults. So the promises are telehealth, rehabilitation, uh, socialization, breaking the isolation, assistive uh, robots and um, uh, autonomous uh, living and ambient living um, spaces. Uh, but of course, we need, we are still grappling with human factors, the safety, efficacy, accessibility, um, and the experience of users of these technologies. And of course, the social factors of inclusivity and equity, um, they are um, less in the, in the imagination of a lot of um, engineers who are designing these technologies. That's where we need social scientists to actually come, come and help. So in the Media Health Lab, the work that we do is 
um, inspired by the neuroscience of um, stress and the fact that chronic stress um, is going to have negative health consequences. Um, and in the Media Health Lab, uh, we try to uh, develop technologies, media technologies that are interactive and, uh, and, and playful. And this is the theoretical model that we work with. Um, any organism from the most basic to advanced, the garden worm to, you know, to an uh, uh, intelligent human, they rely on metabolism uh, in order to function. And then this metabolism relies on the ability to move and sense the environment and also gather the rewards and avoid dangers as we are um, surviving um, day to day. And this process requires um, attention to tasks and to activities that are going to give us the skills that we need to gather these rewards and to feed our met metabolic um, needs on a, uh, on a constant basis. And this is why we need memory and that's how we are learning. And we argue that this is the zone uh, that we can um, sort of mediate the stress of living, the stress of illness and disability um, via play, which is sort of creating this uh, augmented environment in which we can manipulate the reward system through media technologies that would be um, uh, interacting with our learning skill development, skill sharing, and also sensation. But the question that we are also interested in is whether these technologies are helping or hurting. Uh, we started with this question of uh, games and uh, the prevalence of um, uh, playfulness using digital means for older adults. And we did a set of um, studies in a um, study that was called Finding Better Games for Older Adults. This was a participatory um, project um, initially in phase one. It was a quantitative study and the uh, objective was to ask whether um, confrontation or being introduced to a new technology is going to be physically, biologically, physiologically stressful to older adults. That led us to learn that, in fact, uh, the biggest um, stressor was the fact that most older adults were not familiar with the technology. So in phase two, we set up um, a program to actually teach them about uh, the about serious games and then how games work and whether they would be useful for them. And in phase three, uh, we were more interested um, in um, older adults participating and having a conversation about the serious games and their affordance or their lack of in their, um, in their lives. So in the very first um, study, we found that yes, indeed, confrontation with these new technologies was physiologically um, stressful, depending on what kind of game they were playing and what were the perceptions um, of, uh, of the medium that was presented to them, whether it was useful, whether it was meaningful, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we also found is that this relationship is complex and is heavily mediated by not only the cognitive um, and emotional reserves of individuals, but also their physiological um, ability, their, their physiological baselines. Um, I'm not going to go into these details. You can read these papers, they're all open access. Um, um, but the most important take home message from um, this two year long project uh, was that there is a lack of intergenerational understanding of the needs and the motivations of different groups. So initially when we came to these 100 hours of um, conversation, um, we, we had a population of younger students. So first, I have to mention that the first problem that we had, there were not enough young people um, from, you know, from our game programs who were interested in participating in this kind of, uh, in this kind of, um, in this kind of work, despite the fact that we were paying students as research assistants, only few um, joined us. Um, and the other was the misunderstanding in terms of the affordances of games and then what games are. For the young uh, generation, games are a medium of communication. These are their new novels, their new films, their new, uh, you know, their new books. But for the older generation, they are a waste of time of the younger, of the younger adults. So in this conversation, we identified that a need for conversation is actually um, more, more important and more pertinent to, to everyone. 
The other thing that we learned is that people who are participating in this kind of research are not necessarily representative of the aging pop population. It's mostly people who have access to these technologies or the time or the physical and mental ability to participate in design with us. And the generational stereotypes, I did talk about them, but in terms of what these individuals liked in terms of these media for their uh, cognitive, emotional, and social experience was the uh, virtual reality. So we set up um, a living lab in a, in a shopping mall to sort of bring our work into the public and to ask, you know, to sort of open it to a larger population uh, who are not coming to our fitness center basically for participating in these um, academic studies. Um, and again, virtual reality was, was quite popular. Um, and then we were hit with the pandemic. And that's when we re realized that, you know, all these technologies that we are talking about are actually quite, uh, quite dangerous. I could not go and put my headset on anybody's head. Now we have moved all of these activities to, um, to the Facebook and there we are confronted with the challenge of uh, keeping people engaged with Zoom. That is a very difficult experience, especially with the heterogeneity of um, individuals who are coming to these, uh, uh, to these, um, to these um, online um, sessions. Some cannot hear well, some cannot see well, some do not understand my accent. Some, so each of us have different kinds of um, um, limitations. But at the same time, everybody is pushing and especially we are now um, scraping the Facebook and um, Reddit and Twitter just to see what people are saying. And then everybody's pushing these technologies, especially uh, virtual reality for the well-being of, of the older adults. Now, of course, when it is feasible to sort of introduce virtual reality to them in one of the largest studies that I have uh, found so far, it seems that the experience of virtual reality is not necessarily. So these are in, in paleo have uh, what these um, older adults experienced before going into a VR uh, session and then after. They feel less rested and less curious after they try it. And ironically, although we are uh, promoting these for their breaking isolation, they seem to make individuals more tired and also more lonely. These are the questions that we need to be asking when we are pushing technology into the lives of older adults. And so what is the next step um, in introducing any, uh, any new medium to the lives of anyone? Um, I think it's safe to go with the laws of media by Marshall McLuhan and his time. Um, and the question is that we have to ask, what is it enhancing or intensifying? What is it rendering obsolete and for displaces? What does it retrieve that was previously um, obsolete? And then if we push it to the end, what happens? And in investigating this question, we sort of definitely have to take a participatory, um, a participatory approach, but we also have to have some form of um, an evaluation method that is grounded in objective variables. Um, and so in, in this framework that we uh, proposed in effective game planning for health application, we start with the needs, those needs are actual medical needs of individuals, but then we have to spend a good bit of time to evaluate the importance of these technological and medical innovations against the desires of the individuals who are interacting with them. And of course, there, are, uh, there is a long um, list of methodological, um, the methods that are at our disposal. And actually there are open science platforms existing that can facilitate the sharing of the data across these heterogeneous um, studies that we are doing around the world. So unifying these um, studies is going to provide us enough data to actually understand what is happening better. So in closing, I want to thank the numerous um, sort of uh, uh, centers and programs and entities that have been um, supporting this, this work that I talked about. Um, it's of course would not have been possible without the participation of our enthusiastic uh, um, uh, grannies who came and, and played with us. The work was done at Perform Center and supported by the Milieu Institute um, of um, Arts and uh, Engage and also TAG. Um, and MSIN is where we have the host of open um, science uh,
platforms that I hope uh, we would be sort of uh, um, adapting into our technological developments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Very, very, very interesting um, work and presentation. Mm -hmm. I uh, want to invite uh, Bettina Ferman from Fondation Fides to actually uh, take the, the floor. Thank you. Uh, just to, to give you the, the context, we are currently building one of the biggest uh, social innovation hub in, in Europe, gathering uh, nine of the main social enterprises uh, in the Geneva State and, and Republic. Amongst our social enterprise partner, um, you have like organization with disabled people, with people with a mental health problem, as well as uh, elderly. Uh, and what brings them together, or at least the, the common uh, denominator, is that they are really including disabled uh, elderly within their co-activities that can be commercial uh, or, or not. Um, what I have uh, discovered while uh, building this hub is uh, how important in terms of innovation and social innovation is to create links uh, between different worlds that uh, it's not that they ignore each other, they just don't know the other exists. Uh, and I have a, a very specific uh, example of uh, creating a link between uh, Clairebois, which is a foundation um, dealing with disabled people, and uh, ACA Health and the Campus Biotech. And basically, they were 10 kilometers between these two institutions, and they just didn't know one another exist and they end up finding solutions uh, for uh, for a young uh, person that is uh, in Clairebois. So just to really explain how complicated it is to create connection even within uh, you would say a small city like uh, like Geneva. Uh, I was quite uh, um, touched by what Marta said uh, in her um, in her speech about the stigmatization uh, of uh, disabled people in Asia. Uh, the social enterprise Trajet uh, that is dealing with mental health uh, just uh, had his 20th birthday. And the innovation of the founder was just to realize that if you keep disabled people in one single area, therefore, uh, they are not going to, to live and be uh, noble citizens uh, within the city. So the innovation of Trajet was basically to uh, build not only um, uh, houses, but also uh, social enterprises within the town in order to, to give uh, visibility and a sense of uh, uh, utility for disabled to be part of uh, of the city uh, agenda. So this was 20 years ago, Marta, and uh, the floor is yours in, in Asia. Another example, uh, in order to, uh, to go, I would say, beyond innovation is really a matter of uh, education and educating uh, the very uh, small children about disability. And another example in our, in our city is with the Ensemble Foundation. And they basically um, brought their own children in uh, regular uh, school children. And this means that there are no barriers between disabled children and so to speak, uh, um, normal children, Maggie, sorry if I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> um, if I don't use the, the correct word. Uh, and again, I think that when we talk about uh, uh, innovation uh, at large, 
uh, there are many different levels of uh, of innovation technology is for sure very important and will be more and more important but creating the links between uh, the skills the world uh, and the needs on the ground seems to be uh, really important and in, in this regard i would say that the uh, hacker else uh, is a very interesting uh, tool that in a way um, fulfill a number of criteria that, that helps uh, but nevertheless and I don't rec uh, record who, who mentioned it how to formalize the result how to make it uh, open source and in a way not to reinvent the wheel but really try to to scale up what has been uh, um, identified as a solution for one single uh, uh, human being and how to replicate uh, seems to for me uh, the biggest innovation we could uh, all look uh, after thank you very much Petina, for this uh, back to the ground uh... Uh, uh, speech. Uh, my first question is uh, goes to to Najem. I wonder if you can reflect a bit uh, a bit further on the, the, the centrality of gaming in this uh, in this uh, situation of uh, uh, for this instance of aging and disabilities abroad. I think so far what we have found is that the games um, their um, their meaning to especially to the older adults are different than to than to younger ones. So if you are presenting a game to them that has a specific um, a benefit, a specific health benefit, then they seem to be interested in engaging with it. But, but I think that is not an engagement that is going to, um, to continue uh, for very long. Uh, older adults are playing games to pass time, to avoid boredom, uh, to relax. Uh, but then if they want to do a cognitive enhancement or physical rehabilitation, they prefer to do actual activities. They prefer to knit, to have conversation, to have social interactions over, um, over games. This is something that they have been telling us over and over again. However, um, we have to um, sort of separate games from playfulness. Playfulness is important to them. Uh, playfulness has an element of experimentation and socialization, and that is not necessarily a gamified approach to, to health. In the gamification, uh, we are focusing on reward as a mechanism um, that, is driven, um, to, that is driven by a goal. So for instance, if I am to tell somebody, if you're going to play this game, you're going to improve your memory, I'm immediately putting a lot of stress on them by raising the expectation that if they don't do well, if they don't improve their memory, then there is something, something that's, that's wrong with them. So, and then that's when um, usually people quit these things. This is why a lot of us are starting these, using these apps, but then we give up uh, very soon because we are not meeting the, the goals that the app is setting for us. Um, so I think playfulness is very important. Gamification is something that, uh, that, needs, to be, um, that needs to be nuanced a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's what we are working towards, quantifying what are the elements that would that would make a playful activity also gameful and whether gamefulness is is necessary for health applications i hope i answered your question yes thank you very much it's a, it's great very sub substantial response i was not expecting that much so thank you so much my question go second question goes to Maggie. you get a very great experience uh, during a hackathon this hackathon happens to be very compassionate because it has been designed this way to be really centered around the person who is uh, experiencing the, the um, who is disabled. And uh, you, I mean, I see, I, I was there physically, you see really engineers, designers, journalists, whoever, just around the, the disabled person for 48 hours and asking this person, what do you need actually? How can we help you? And then come, coming and bootstrapping. Oh, I tried that. C can you try what, what you think of it and so on? But, but then what we, we could just do to push the envelope and to make that even more efficient and uh, yeah. long lasting and, and, uh, and, and meaningful. It's sort of been for us dependent on the participants itself in the team, in, in this team. So luckily we've had um, last year and this year, um, 
individuals in the team that have actually been really uh, engaged. And so they actually came on their own uh, time afterwards. But I think it does, like I said, this definitely need to be formalized. Um, well, I, you know, I had this conversation last night with my husband and we were wondering if, you know, it's, if the idea of, of, of a 48 hour time frame is really interesting. I think it brings motivation. I think it brings a sense of urgency and that I think um, brings a certain energy to the event. But I'm wondering, um, I don't really have an answer to your question, Thomas, but I actually was wondering if there couldn't be sort of like maybe an a second hackathon, but maybe not so visual, maybe not so communicated, but something that actually is still organized per se. So the participants have to come in a way, have to come. Nobody has to do anything, but um, they're encouraged to come and actually finalize. I don't think it, again, that needs to be actually a full hackathon where, you know, the communication is the same, but I think there do, does need to be a, maybe a second smaller event just to finalize. So it's not also so on the shoulders of a few certain people that actually want to do it or have the time to do it. Yes, uh, it's a question for me. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you, you turned the question around. Uh, <laughs> uh, we could have a long discussion after hack, but the, the, the simple answer to your question is you, you doing a hackathon, you're just loading a lot of interested motivation. So it means people are really into that because they, they believe in that and they, they're just going to deploy a lot of energy. And then it's a bit like a romantic experience in a way, you know, you get just a lot of adrenaline and it's really nice. And then of course, at some point there's a decay and this decay can be shorter or longer. So first thing is we want to maximize, to, to make this decay as, as low as possible. But then at some point, you know, the reality takes over. So if we want to have people engaged, we have to we have to push in extrinsic motivation. So we have to to give people actually ways to to uh, to to actually get a benefit, uh, which is more than just uh, just a pleasure. Otherwise, no, it's not going to work. So all the other way to go around is to actually uh, reduce the cost of uh, of maintain of uh, of contributing. So on the long run, if it costs less and less to people to contribute more efficiently. Then, then it's okay. When we look around, uh, good enough. So we, we we spend enough time looking around. We can find all the solutions we we need. Basically, yet maybe with just an epsilon, a, a very slight difference between what we really need and what exists already. But the searching costs seem to be to be enormous. Do you have a, a, a trick? Do you have like a specific thing that you want to implement to to make these uh, bridges and these links between between people in the most efficient way? Question is uh, whether I have a uh, baguette magic. <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't. What um, coming back to this very specific uh, period we are we we all live. Um, uh, there were a lot of innovation within organization because of the crisis, uh, and. Uh, and when talking about uh, elderly people, it was the case uh, at the Red Cross uh, in, in Geneva, also how to basically uh, bring uh, food and, and support to uh, elderly. Uh, now, I believe that um, innovation came within the organization th themselves. And I myself uh, questioning how uh, Innovation Lab can bring innovation at this time of a crisis. And my first answer is that Innovation Lab are not the best one to provide the best innovation in times of crisis inside uh, organization or uh, even amongst the, the beneficiary. Now, telling this, and I might say something totally different in six months, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't need to gather the people in order to exchange uh, best practices. And this is for sure uh, one of the goal of the, the Fides Lab. Um, but you need to find the motivation to share this experience, even though uh, they don't have uh, a direct, uh, I would say, return on investment. 
And I think if we find this uh, advantage, uh, it will be important. And again, we see a lot of uh, online sharing and how to grab this and make it really real for the people. Uh, it's also a, a question uh, I put on the table. So, sorry, Thomas, a lot of question, not a lot of answer, but uh, I believe that's the way uh, innovation will, will come. A lovely answer. That's, uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, one thing I re re remember is this question of motivation for mm. people to, to get together. And I have a last question for, for, for Marta. Actually, it's a question from Najme, uh, which I'm going to take from the chat. Thank you for helping me in moderating uh, Najme. Uh, so the question is, does uh, the stigmatization against disability also coincide with lack of care and social support? In I'm not an expert on, on, on disability in Asia Pacific, and, but I will just want to transmit what we've um, seen there. Asia Pacific is very broad and um, countries are very different. So Singapore is very different from Thailand um, in terms, for example, of having infra uh, infrastructure environment uh, for persons with disability. One of the things that shocked me is you don't see persons, oh, there's no need to develop wheelchairs because persons with disability don't go out of their house because their families are ashamed of them and they, they are secluded. So that, that's something that um, I felt very strongly. And this is a, a person uh, uh, that, um, with disability and, and well-educated and, and um, sharing the, uh, that um, how he lives. And the other uh, key issue that he points out is this about universal design and um, the design of cities. So um, in, in Bangkok, it's impossible to go um, uh, on a wheelchair or even, even for children to, to push. Uh, it's impossible. There, there, is no, um, there, there is no pavement. There is, um, you have to go up and down all the time. Um, there, um, the, the air train is the, one of the main means of uh, moving. And, only some stations have elevators and they may be across the road where you are, but then you don't have a passage to cross the road. So that, that that's, um, so it's all, all this environmental. And for example, Thailand is very good in, in health systems in, in overall in general, but it, it really does badly in, in terms of, from what has been conveyed in terms of um, infrastructure and um, and having um, yeah, this enabling and then in, um, culturally in terms of uh, stigma. There's a, a lot of, um, I, I guess, superstitions um, and, and this is very cultural. But then each country will be different. And I have um, seen initiatives, for example, in Bangkok on integrating persons with disability uh, I'm not Thai and I don't speak Thai, so I, I, I don't know what's happening in, in the Thai world, but um, parents with persons with disability, um, they, um, they, they say there's a lack of, of uh, healthcare, trained healthcare for persons with uh, mental disabilities, and they often rely on uh, a few expats that can provide those services um, here. And similarly, there are a few social enterprises that I'm aware of working with uh, persons with disability and that offer um, uh, workspace and training, um, both in Thailand and in Cambodia. And they're all um, driven or set up by um, experts, by, by foreigners. But I mean, there may be more, but that's what uh, yeah, um, I come across. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we are running a bit out of time. Uh, um, really, thank you for 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 being part of this panel. I we got in the so this this project is supported by the Swiss Confederation and the Swiss Embassy in China, um, uh, as well as the Geneva Chingwen Initiative at the University of Geneva, United Nations Institute for Training and Research, Open Geneva, and the Geneva Health Forum. So 
we get supported all over. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I realized that in our mission statement, we we have to actually do a desk research on what are the, the most important problems that we have to solve for aging and disabilities. And now I realized that from this panel, we're not going to do any desk research. We're going to organize more panels because I took so many, so many notes, so much, so much, in, so much great information, very practical information that uh, that we we could share today. And I'm, I hope, hopefully, it's going to enrich all of us, not not only our project. And um, and I'm really grateful for your for your for your presentations, for your for the the, the substance of your presentation, and for your your testimonies. And uh, Yes, I also want to thank uh, Fabio Bali, uh, the, the the leader of the Open Village, and and also um, Aphrodite Anastasaki, who is uh, um, uh, intern at uh, UNITA and at the University of Geneva, uh, for amazing work putting putting up this panel together in a, I don't know five days, something like that. So we we've been we've been quite agile there. there. So thank you very much, everyone, and. Uh, uh, have a nice uh, rest of day or a nice uh, breakfast for, for Najme. Thanks for, for joining us so early. Thank you very much.